I would like to welcome you all to our panel on challenges in time and space. Uh, this panel will offer different observations and reconsiderations in regards to human-animal relations in spheres that are somewhat similar, yet at the same time different in India, the United States, and Israel. On the surface, they will explore uh, the relations with cats and dogs in the urban environment, but they actually dive into much deeper layers and tackle social and political root questions and issues such as agency, culture, and space, and our attitude towards nature uh, as a whole. So I will not give you any more spoilers. I will leave uh, the panelists to discuss this. Uh, we'll have um, three presentations in this panel, followed by a discussion and a Q&A. Uh, you are welcome to write down questions and comments in the chat box. Uh, you're also able to use the raise hand um, option uh, later on. Um, so just please wait with the questions until we finish. And also, if you're writing any comments or questions, please write to whom you're referring them to. Um, so without further ado, let's start with our panelists. Uh, we will now turn to uh, Anu Pandey from the English and Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad, India. Um, Anu, uh, on a personal note, also thank you very much uh, from us to the HATI conference team uh, for joining us despite the difficult times in India in regard to the COVID pandemic. And we hope that the situation will keep improving over there. So thank you for being here. Uh, so I think you can now share your slide. Thank you, Amnon. So I shall just start right away. In this presentation, mm -hmm. I propose to explore how my reading of Pen Farthing's One Dog at a Time, Saving the Dogs of Helmand and Jake Opelman's From Baghdad with Love, A Marine, The War, and A Dog Named Lava, and my experience of feeding 12 street dogs in an industrial zone in Hyderabad, India, during the COVID lockdown in 2020, mutually informed and influenced each other, enabling me to perceive the ways in which text and context operate in human animal studies. Farthing, a Royal Marine posted in Afghanistan, and Kopelman, a Lieutenant Colonel in the US Marine Corps posted in Iraq, write about the trials and tribulations of rescuing street dogs from war-ravaged countries and transporting them to the United States and Great Britain for adoption. The intertwining of my personal experience with the dogs and my reception of the two texts drew my attention to the problems inherent in the one-size-fits-all approach taken towards street dog rescue and adoption efforts. Both the scenarios I discuss, the daily feeding of street dogs in Hyderabad with all the materiality of their physical presence, as well as the rescue of dogs from Afghanistan and Iraq in the two texts, are located against the backdrop of a catastrophe. The COVID crisis in the former scenario and war in the latter. I will begin by addressing the question of what street dogs, as opposed to breed dogs, and their precarious and liminal existence signify in the cultural context that play in this scenario, while also drawing attention to the psychosocial effects of a close interaction with non-human animals, especially dogs, upon human animals. I will attempt to critically examine and decolonize the gesture of rescue in the two texts by drawing attention to the incons inconsistencies and assumptions inherent in it, which are based on the colonial and anthropocentric binaries of civilization or barbarism, victor or vanquished, developed or backward, human or animal, and rescuer or rescued. Furthermore, I will show how an anthropocentric approach that ignores the animal's agency while rescuing them can have disastrous consequences, regardless of how well-meaning the attempts may be. The two texts I refer to enabled me to see how a gaze emanating from the Western epistemological tradition constructs street dogs in Afghanistan, Iraq, and for that matter, India, as animals that need to be rescued and homed, whereas the streets are their homes in the multi-species cityscapes they inhabit. I do not attempt to suggest that all street dogs have happy lives. I acknowledge that they are exposed to hunger, accidents, cruelty, and disease, but this does not directly or necessarily imply that rescue and homing is the answer. There are fundamental differences between the global north and south in how the place of street dogs in human society is understood. In the global north, they are mostly erstwhile pet dogs that have been abandoned by their owners, have run away from home or are lost. Sorry about that. In the global south, on the other hand, in Southeast Asia, for example, and more specifically in India, this is not the case. India has an estimated population of 35 to 40 million Indian pariah dogs born on the streets of Indian cities who forage for food and garbage, 
although many are also fed regularly or irregularly by humans. Public uh, health know. approaches and yeah. I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm just, I just wanted to make sure that we are still seeing the, the first slide. Uh, so I wasn't sure if that's your intention, but just be aware that this oh. is the two. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, then, I'm sorry. I was I was assuming that it might be a long introduction, but then it just seemed to <laughs> it to be really long. Let me so. just uh, let me move this way, and maybe now do you see a different slide? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'll do this manually then. So, yeah. So all for right. No, thank you for letting me know. Um, I'll just continue. Public health approaches in India, whether killing or ABC ARV at present, are based on neo-colonial views of street dogs as stray, heavily influenced by Western conceptions of dogs as having to be under human ownership. In 19th century Britain, continental Europe, and the United States, animal and human vagabondage had been frowned upon, resulting in hostility towards unowned dogs who were increasingly seen to symbolize uncivilized urban cultures and blamed for spreading rabies. Pearson traces how fears of vagrancy and crime, urban modernization projects, public hygiene movements, and the increasing practice of keeping pedigree pet dogs turned the stray dog into an unwelcome presence on the streets of Paris. The city could only become safe, clean, and modern if the authorities would solve the problem of stray dogs. British colonial authorities imported similar attitudes and policies to India and began treating street dogs as part of the problematic, subversive, and suspect Indian urban environment that needed controlling and containing. Indeed, the word pariah was applied by the British to denote India's lowest castes, outcasts, and free roaming dogs. On the other hand, if we look at public perceptions of street dogs in India, they occupy a rather different place in society, which is constantly evolving under transnational influences. In the first sustained and in-depth empirical study carried out in November 2017 of society street dog relationships in India that examines social, multi-species, institutional, and public health dimensions simultaneously, Srinivasan et al. established that public perceptions of street dogs are more complex than either positive or negative. They are neither seen entirely as valued nor as pestilent non-human life, but as being always on the threshold. Street dogs are seen as rightful cohabitants of the multi-species city, even though they might pose problems. In addition, they are recognized as vulnerable creatures that belong in the city, even though they are not owned by people. In this sense, they are not just out of place animals that need controlling, rescuing or homing, but beings with the legal societal legitimacy. It is this stark difference in the place of street dogs that makes Kopelman and Farthing, soldiers from the global north, stationed in the global south, look at the street dogs in Fallujah and Helmand as out of place, pitiable dogs who will not survive on the streets where they live and leads them to assume that these unowned dogs have never encountered compassion or care. Their rescue attempts are in this sense, attempts to put the street dogs in place in a home with a human. Public attitudes towards street dogs in India are mixed. There are people who feed them outside their homes, allow them to sleep in yards or stairwells, place water bowls for them outside and provide dog coats for them during the winter, but do not perceive them as pets. Meaningful and significant bonds of companionship and care also develop between shopkeepers, restaurant workers, vendors, and street dogs. Srinivasan's research shows that pavement dwellers and waste workers who live in the closest proximity to street dogs overwhelmingly see them as rightful cohabitants of the city, have strong relationships with specific street dogs, and a high degree of kinesthetic empathy with them. All the waste workers and pavement dwellers interviewed by Srinivasan regularly fed street dogs with leftovers, biscuits, or food separated from garbage and tended to see them as a source of comfort, as companions, as providing security, as subjects of affection and care. Such interactions of interdependency and reciprocal care indicate that street dogs are valued members of a multi-species society and that positive affective relations between people and street dogs contribute to the psychosocial well-being of both parties. 
On the other hand, respondents who want street dogs to go away and cite the risk of rabies and the wish to live in street dog free, clean, safe, and modern cities typically belong to a higher socioeconomic segment of the population that have minimal contact with street dogs. This anthropocentric biopolitical neo-colonialism employs narratives based on fear and contempt to segregate human and non-human animals, given that the latter resist all attempts to make them disappear. Expanding upon Ananya Roy's concept of subaltern urbanism, Yamini Narayanan calls this resistance of street dogs subaltern animism. Examples of subaltern animism are found in the agency and resistance of the dogs in Helmand that Farthing writes about, who refuse to disappear in spite of war and the hostility of the army top brass. The street dogs as social constructs are also embedded within larger contexts of attitudes, prejudices, and stereotypes. Ben Farthing describes Afghan policemen as cruel, barbaric, dirty with greasy strands of hair, badly stained uniforms and in need of a wash and mentions the stench of their breath. She also assumes that the dogs he encounters in Afghanistan have never been treated kindly or with compassion. This assumption is based on the fact that the dog in question, Nozad, a fighting dog, does not bite him when he pets him for the first time, which would actually seem to indicate that the dog was accustomed to gentle human touch. Until Nauzad is named, the author repeatedly refers to him as beast or beast dog, thereby including him in his negative appraisal of the local population. Farthing's dogs at home are always Bhima and Fizz. He repeatedly distinguishes between his well-behaved dogs in the civilized world and the nightmarish beast dog in barbaric Afghanistan. It is difficult to not see a colonial gaze at work here. The nightmarish beast dog of the cruel, barbaric, dirty Afghans must be saved, notwithstanding his beastliness, or perhaps precisely because of it. A post-colonial reading of the encounter between Farthing and the dogs, however, reveals the dogs' agency in co-constructing the contact zone. It is the dogs who dig their way into the compound under the wall, constantly negotiate boundaries, trenches, and prohibitions, hide their puppies in a sewer to ward off the excessive attention from the soldiers, escape when they want to, and return when they please. And to scorn the soldiers in training with whom he patrolled Fallujah as wide-eyed, inept, untrained, out of shape, terrified, immoral, thieving, lying, and backward. He sees it as his job to make them like us, meaning disciplined, morally upright, superior, and civilized by him and in dresses and fat women behind veils. The project of making them like us is extended to the puppy Lava as well, who should, I quote, make it to California and get to be an American dog who runs on the beach and chases the mailman instead of strangers with guns. End of quote. In reality, however, the biggest and most imminent threat for Lava and for Farthing's dogs in Afghanistan as well was not the local human population. Instead, it was the British and US Army's policy of executing all street dogs found in the camps. Later, once Lava is living with him in America, Kopelman, who is slowly recovering from PTSD, describes Lava's occasional aggression towards strangers and again projects his own impressions and memories of Iraq onto his dog. I quote, Lava is still the product of his upbringing, though. Like we'll be driving down the road and pass some guy on the sidewalk who's minding his own business, but something about him gets Lava to thinking about Iraq, I guess, like maybe the way he walks or the way he's dressed, and Lava goes absolutely certifiably straight to the moon and back wild. Kobelman has taken Lava out of Iraq, but seems to believe that he cannot take Iraq out of Lava. The gesture of rescue in both scenarios is also fraught with the pitfalls of anthropocentrism. Only three of the five street dogs that Ben Farthing attempted to rescue from Helmand made it to the shelter in Kabul, whereas the other two escaped from the taxi in which they were being transported. The legs of the dogs had been tied together to prevent them from running away, and the aggressive dog Nozad had his muzzle taped shut. Farthing acknowledged that he wouldn't get any RSPCA awards for this rescue. Yet, the two dogs got away, 
leaving farthing with the nightmare image of them abandoned on the side of the road and the disturbing certainty that they were dead. In addition, Dushka, another dog outside the compound, whom Farthing wanted to rescue next, was shot dead by a new soldier. Dushka had gone running towards the soldier anticipating food because he was used to being fed by Farthing and the soldier panicked and shot him. These instances of what Narayanan calls the planned or unplanned collapsing of canine boundaries by humans acutely depict canine agency, resistance and assertion of space. The dogs' resistance calls for their recognition as actors rather than as passive subjects in the making or unmaking of the urban spaces that they perceive as their home or territory. In Hyderabad, I too learned about multi-species sense of place the hard way when in April 2020, I accidentally ran over a puppy that I had been regularly feeding since late January. On the day in question, two adult dogs that I had never seen there before came suddenly for the food I had placed on the roadside for the puppy. And he, unknown to me, unanticipated by me, hid under my car. What I thought I knew about the territories of the individual dogs in the area evidently did not work during the extraordinary circumstances of the lockdown. Driven by hunger, two adult dogs disrupted the established canine territories. This experience, besides inducing grief and guilt, made me recognize that dogs have their own conception of the urban ecology that they inhabit and their place in it. Anthropocentric rescue efforts that ignore this multi-species sense of place are likely to fail or even be disastrous in their consequences. Narayanan highlights the risk of provoking aggression among street dogs when activists and dog feeders unintentionally disrupt established canine territories. My experience with the puppy taught me that even when we intentionally and carefully respect established canine territories, we lack a multi-species sense of place the instinctive ability to perceive multi-species boundaries and foresee the transgressions that can and do occur within it. In conclusion, reading the two texts and engaging with the dogs in Hyderabad made me think about how the Western model of dog ownership has become the norm globally. Driven by transnational influences, public health and animal welfare organizations in India advise against killing street dogs but still treat them as populations that need surveillance and management, promoting responsible dog ownership as a key foundation for human and animal health. Both strategies, however, are problematic because of the underlying common colonial and anthropocentric conceptualization of street dogs as stray, out of place animals and disease vectors to be managed for human health. My aim is not to argue against rescuing and adopting street dogs, Instead, by drawing attention to some inconsistencies inherent in the gesture of rescue, I propose a disruptive shift in thinking about street dog rescue in countries like India, where street dogs have historically been intrinsic parts and rightful cohabitants of urban multi-species landscapes and where the Western model does not fit. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Anu. That was really, really interesting and also relates, I think, to other issues that we can further discuss here. Um, our next presentation is by uh, Maria Eugenia Dominguez and Miriam Young from the New School in New York. Um, Miriam, I understand you'll be uh, sharing your screen, right? Yes, exactly. And it should be. Okay. And it's so working well. Okay. So you have 15 minutes and I might let you know like a couple of minutes uh, before time ends. Perfect. That sounds great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Anu. That was um, fascinating. And I think there's a lot of interesting connections from your research into ours. Um, so yes, hello, everyone. My name is Miriam. And um, myself and Maria Eugenia are so delighted to be here today. So we are recent graduates from the Transdisciplinary Design MFA program out of Parsons uh, School of Design in New York City. Um, I myself am interested in multi-species placemaking and have been researching human and animal relationships, especially in the urban environment. And today I am joined by my colleague. Hi, I'm Maria Eugenia. I have a background in visual design, urban design, and landscape architecture. Uh, as Miriam mentioned, I'm also a recent grad from the Trans Transdisciplinary Design MFA from the New School Parsons. And I guess we can get started with our project of Brooklyn Street Tree Typology, examining multi-species relations in urban tree wells. 
So I live in Brooklyn and this is a fairly typical streetscape that you're seeing here. So as you can see, trees kind of generally line the streets in this way, spaced out. And uh, this is especially true in the more affluent uh, neighborhoods in Brooklyn. Um, the tiny patches of land that surround each tree are called tree wells and they are often fenced off. And um, I've always been kind of fascinated by how local residents interact with street trees and attempt to kind of manage these tiny spaces. Um, dogs are very popular as pets here, so trees are kind of a major battleground as far as where dogs may uh, go to the bathroom. Um, so I've grown slightly obsessed with documenting the hundreds of different kinds of handmade don't poop here signs that you're seeing here. Um, they're often comically posted at dogs I view, uh, which I think is interesting. And, um, and there's actually just like a lot of rules that these tiny spaces uh, tend to have. So in the bottom right, you can see this photo of a, you know, it's perhaps like two feet by three feet, very small patch of land. And there's so many rules, no dogs, no bikes, no flower picking allowed. So in Brooklyn, there are over 140,000 street trees that provide benefits to urban dwellers like capturing stormwater and providing shade. Yet they also shine a light on the dysfunctional ways we uh, Brooklynites tend to interact with and view the nature around us. Uh, for example, urban trees are often alone. While in the wild, trees are hyper-connected creatures communicating and sharing nutrients with one another through their root networks. In the city, in Brooklyn, uh, in this case, they are isolated, fenced off on tiny plots of land called tree wells. Some tree wells are neglected, covered in trash, while others are micromanaged by local residents with all kinds of handmade signage enforcing the rules of these small areas. These tiny signs raise huge questions. What urban creatures are allowed to use the space in which are kept out? Who owns these tiny patches of land? Who acts as their steward? What is the purpose of a street tree? Decoration, a home, or a place to mark your territory? So in conducting this research, we started to wonder, how did we get here? Why does it seem that instances of nature in the city are so hopelessly isolated? Upon taking a look at the historical planning of the city, we can start to understand why we have these seemingly limited patches of nature in the urban environment. There have been many movements in city planning and it's actually a practice uh, dating back to ancient times. However, since we're speaking in generalities, we notice that American cities are mostly influenced by the modernist movement in architecture. With its rectilinear layouts and destructive grand top-down designs, modernism's ethos can be reflected in this one quote from Le Corbusier who was the biggest figure of the movement. The design of cities was too important to be left to the citizens. That begs the question, if most cities were not planned for even pedestrians in mind, was there much thought given to the animals, plants, and all of the other wonderful organisms in the fully complex ecosystem? It seems that other than as the occasional decorative element or a little sliver of land here and there, there was very, uh, very little concern given to the natural in the design of cities. The roots of trees were not accounted for, for example, the nests of birds and the burrows of rodents were not planned for, and neither were the interactions between these organisms and humans. So from September 2020 through March 2021, um, we've been photographing tree well signage in the Brooklyn neighborhoods of Park Slope, Prospect Heights, Fort Green, Clinton Hill, Gowanus, Crown Heights, Downtown Brooklyn, Carroll Gardens, Borum Hill, and Brooklyn Heights. I know for most of you, those names may not mean, mean anything, but we just wanted to clarify Brooklyn is a huge area with lots of different types of neighborhoods. So we were more focused on these tend to be kind of the more affluent um, areas. Um, um, so we then analyze the photos, coding them with their individual features and pulling out categories of behaviors and beliefs that emerged. So in total, we unearthed nine categories from our documented crates 
cases to create this Brooklyn street tree typology. These are composite sketches um, that actually show some of the more common human tree creature interactions, conflicts, and configurations that we saw. Now, the goal of this work is not to design a better tree well or better signage. Our hypothesis is if you can look closely at how, in this case, Brooklynites interact with and manage these tiny green spaces, perhaps that can tell us something of our embedded attitudes towards nature to inform how we manage or mismanage larger ecological questions. Uh, in a way then, this is less a typology of tree wells and more a typology of dysfunctional, in this case, Brooklynite views towards urban wildlife. Um, so there's a link to the full typology at the end of the presentation, but we're gonna walk through a few examples. So our first uh, very prevalent type, we called territorial peeings or poopings. Uh, it's our most well-documented type. Um, we know that dogs use peeing as a form of signage or as a way to signal their comings and goings. And in these cases, we see that humans mark their territory through threatening signage. We wonder though, in reality, who do these green spaces truly belong to after all? Regardless of who legally maintains the space, as is evidenced by the vast amounts of unofficial and handmade signage we've come across. It seems that Brooklynites have been stepping up to act as stewards or enforcers of these spaces, themselves dictating who may or may not make use of them. And dogs are not the only ones being kept out. So in this next category, no creatures allowed, um, humans are attempting to protect the tree by preventing most creaturely interactions with it, even if it means threatening with poison. Um, so for these trees, the messaging is clear. You creature are not allowed to express your creatureness in this green space. And yet in the wild, trees are a key ecological player, host to all kinds of interactions. So these cases are an example of the tendency in American urban planning to keep green spaces isolated and pristine. There is an assumption of what creature should have access to it and for what purposes. In this reductive view, we Brooklynites are perhaps ignoring the complexity of trees as organisms and losing sight of the larger systems they depend on to thrive. Um, for our next one, instead of threats of poison, another approach we saw was protecting the tree through a kind of anthropomorphic attunement. So um, in this case, the signage is encouraging Brooklynites to have consideration and respect for trees um, by falsely implying the trees are just like us. So here we're seeing signs that are written in the imagined kind of personified voice of the tree itself, um, or as I personally found amusing signs like, you know, the tree is busy resting or the tree is busy working. So please don't litter or please don't, um, you know, hurt the tree because of that. So on the one hand, this does seem to combat an assumption the public may hold that plants are dormant, um, but verbs like resting or working aren't exactly true either. These signs play off how we humans relate better with organisms that are similar to us. But what if instead of conceptually turning other life forms into mini versions of humans, we instead instead challenged our human-centered perspectives and considered trees on their own terms and verbs. In contrast to the more micromanaged tree wall types that we saw, we also saw a type that suffers from quite the opposite. We cheeky call this tragedy of the microcommons a little bit of a cheeky way. Um, this category really revealed some of the apathy of Brooklyn residents in contrast to the tree wells with um, much more aggressive signage and rules. These spaces tended to be largely neglected and sometimes treated more as a dumping ground. In Fort Greene, for example, a resident set up an actual trash can next to the tree well to try to encourage people to dispose of dog poop properly. However, it seems that the association of the trash can next to the tree is more hurtful than helpful in the long run. These tree wells seem to belong to no one and the land does not seem worth protecting in stark contrast to the other uh, more micromanaged types that we have documented. 
And so this next category, private garden, um, is uh, really showcasing that for tree wells, instead of being seen as an empty space, as we just saw, these trees are treated almost as sort of giant potted plants um, to make the streetscape more attractive. They are decorated with tchotchkes, knickknacks, mirrors, statues, and other objects. Um, one of my favorite cases was from a tree outside a church that had astroturf, which is like a fake grass, um, cut custom cut right around the trunk of the tree to look as if it was natural grass surrounding surrounding it. So on the one hand, you think of the time it took for someone to do that, um, probably with good intentions, but on the other, adding a fake plastic approximation of nature to an actual tree uh, implies the person is somehow equating this highly complex living organism with inert decoration. So like a private garden or lawn, protecting the ornamentation of these spaces seems to drive much of their signage. Daffodils and tulips stand alongside signs forbidding flower picking. And yet, how can these flowers be claimed as private property in what is ultimately public space? So this type points to the legacy of uh, American urban planning that views street trees more as a way to beautify the city and that if you decorate it, you own it. <laughs> So this last type that we want to share with you today, um, it was one of the rarest types that we documented. And we felt that they seem to say creatures welcome. As I mentioned, even though it's uh, rare, we still wanted to bring this up because there's it's worth reporting that there is at least one tree well in Brooklyn with an astonishing handmade wooden sign that says, dogs welcome, please clean up after. Another tree well was labeled gently with a string of a photo of a dog who had passed away who loved trees. So in a way it was creating a living dog memorial of the tree well. So we felt that the small interventions that were present in these kind of tree wells pointed to a more friendly multi-species relationship between Brooklynites and urban natural spaces. These tree wells inspire us to think about streetscapes in a different and more nuanced way. But to summarize, we really want to stress that we are not saying that there should be dog poop everywhere. That is not the message we are trying to get across. Rather, in creating this typology, we were first aiming to spotlight and then reconceptualize the multi-species uses of urban spaces, such as tree well types. We wonder, rather than forbidding all creatures, threatening with poison, overcomplicating with rules, anthropomorphizing trees as humans, can there be a middle way, perhaps? We aim to recognize trees as important nodes in a much wider web that we also belong to. If only we could, as they say, see the forest for the trees. Ultimately, this typology is just the first step in helping us reimagine cities and streetscapes to be more inclusive of all species of urbanites. And so we'll put the link in the chat if you want to see the full typology. There are three others that we didn't get to cover. Um, and then we look forward to the discussion and your questions. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Miriam and uh, Maria Eugenia. It was really interesting to, to, to hear these insights on, uh, on these mundane experiences that actually you know bear so much weight on how society treats it, um, it or how, how people treat treat their environment uh, and it's good to know that there is at least one sign that says uh, dogs welcome um, so on that note we're also going to welcome our next uh, speaker uh, Liran Plickman from the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs in Israel uh, Liran please the floor is yours just a second Whoops. Okay, can everyone uh, see the? Yes, perfect. Great. Okay. Uh, so, hi everyone. Thanks for thanks for having me. <laughs> I uh, <clears throat> I apologize for advance for in advance for uh, for my voice. I'm recovering from a, a throat infection, so please bear with me. Um, so, um, my name is Liran. I work in the Israeli Animal Welfare Department as the policy coordinator. Uh, and I'll be talking about the public engagement um, process we've been having um, to develop a national strategy for managing free roaming cats in Israel. I'm going to present uh, what we've gathered so far from stakeholders and the public. We're nearing the end of the process, but it's still very much ongoing. Uh, so I don't have a complete picture for you 
for you yet. You'll have to stay tuned if you're interested. Okay, so uh, first things first, uh, why did we choose to conduct a public engagement process regarding free roaming cats at all? I'll call them um, FRC for short sometimes. Uh, basically, we identified a welfare problem um, that also branches out to other areas and has many aspects to do with uh, both humans and animals uh, that all stem from the problem of the overpopulation of free roaming cats. This has consequences for, um, Sorry, my cat is trying to join the party. <laughs> Just a sec. Okay. Um, so um, this this has consequences for obviously the cat's welfare, uh, public health and uh, sanitation, wildlife and the ecosystem, and some view it as a public nuisance as well. So therefore, the objective was to develop a nationwide policy in order to regulate and manage the free roaming cat population. The animal welfare department. Um, in the Ministry of Agriculture is the, regula the regulating body for animal welfare in Israel. So this was basically our job, uh, but with so many stakeholders and interests, and uh, obviously this is a very complicated, very complex and sensitive issue, uh, we thought it best to involve all stakeholders in the decision-making process. So our goals were to find the best practical solutions uh, out there, um, build trust to better implement these solutions and inform the public about different aspects of this problem uh, and more on that later. Uh, so what is the current situation in, uh, in Israel regarding free roaming cats? Um, I'll doubt, I'll, I doubt I'll surprise many Israelis here, but uh, those of you who are from outside the country, uh, basically there is a massive uh, overpopulation of free roaming cats in Israel with numbers estimated around 1 million cats uh, and that's in a tiny country with about 9 million uh, people. So 9 million people, 1 million cats. Um, in Israel, communal feeding is very common, whether it's the occasional feeders that leave out leftovers uh, every now and again, or what we call heavy feeders, permanent feeders uh, that spend money on cat food that actually uh, sometimes travel um, distances to feed cat colonies. Um, as it stands now, there is no uniform national policy. There's no legislation, uh, to not, not a national level anyway, to address this. Um, municipalities basically choose their own policy on the matter, and many times they choose not to have one. Uh, some cities have bylaws regarding public nuisances that are caused by uh, feeding free roaming cats. Some cities attempt to regulate feeding with designated um, feeding stations, but that's about, uh, that's about it. The only, uh, I guess, regular policy on the matter is, um, is subsidies that uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, basically the Animal Welfare Department, hands out uh, to uh, municipalities. Uh, I think for the, past, uh, for the past 10 years it's been happening. Um, so that money uh, is supposed to go to spay and neuter uh, free roaming cats. And it's about 4.5 million shekels, which is the equivalent of uh, 1.4 um, US dollars annually. Okay, so from the beginning, it was clear that with such a complex um, issue, we wanted to have the highest level of public engagement, which is collaboration with uh, stakeholders, with key stakeholders. So not only to receive information from the public and inform the public about different issues, but attempt to forge effective solutions uh, together. <coughs> Excuse me. So we started out by identifying all the stakeholders. Um, there are the obvious ones like uh, those who feed or uh, take care of cats, uh, animal related NGOs, veterinarians who, uh, who work for municipalities. But then there are the, the others uh, not so familiar stakeholders like uh, veterinarians who work in the army and the Israeli uh, IDF who have a problem with free roaming cats and military bases. They have their own laws and regulations there. Uh, there are factories and businesses that um, sometimes uh, deal with food, processed food, uh, or hospitals that have um, free roaming cats on their premises. There are uh, zoologists and ecologists who are worried about the cat's impact on wildlife. And there's the public um, as a whole. Some love cats, some don't, some are indifferent. Um, some don't mind them, but don't, uh, don't like people feeding them um, at their doorsteps. Some don't wanna see kittens suffering on the street. Um, and of course, there is the most important stakeholder of all, the cats themselves. 
So um, with so many stakeholders, we wanted to hear from everyone. We began by putting together a, a steering committee to accompany the process um, with a presentation of key stakeholders. And the idea is that the, the end of the, of, the, of the process, they're supposed to come together um, and uh, give us recommendations and a policy for managing free roaming cats. Uh, but first of all, we wanted to get our facts straight. Uh, what are the main welfare problems that uh, free roaming cats suffer from? What impacts they have on wildlife? What has been done in other countries to address this problem of overpopulation? We spoke with experts both here and, um, and abroad and uh, population management, zoologists and, uh, and ecologists, cat welfare specialists, et cetera. We did uh, group interviews, what we call focus groups with animal NGOs and, um, and cat caretakers with uh, private veterinarians, municipal veterinarians, local government, uh, ministries, Ministry of Health and Environmental Protection. We conducted a survey uh, with a representative sample of Israeli society to better, better understand the, um, the distribution of opinions and perceptions, and also put out a nationwide questionnaire in order to reach out to the general public, let them have a say, um, let them express their, their opinions on the matter. The next steps are the public forum, which is uh, planned uh, to, uh, it, to take place tomorrow. It's a, it's a virtual um, open forum. Um, where we're basically going to show uh, what we've done so far and, um, and answer questions from the public. Uh, later, we're planning on uh, roundtables, which is uh, the, the, the last, I think, most important step of the process, finally having different stakeholders uh, sit down together, discuss main topics such as spaying programs and reg regulating feeding, uh, and hopefully achieve some agreements on, on strategies. Okay. So whenever we engage with public, with public and the stakeholders, we ask two main questions. First of all, what do you think the problem is with the overpopulation of free roaming cats? Do you view it as a positive or negative uh, um, uh, phenomenon or their presence in, in the public life? And what do you believe should be done about it? What do you think the solution should be? So as it turns out, things got complicated even before answering the, our question. Uh, some didn't like the use of the word problem in regards to free roaming cats. They wanted to uh, they wanted us to define uh, an issue or a phenomenon. So the trouble is, first of all, if there's no problem, what exactly are we attempting to fix? Uh, and secondly, I think most important, I think definitely it is a problem for the free roaming cats themselves. The overpopulation is a very real problem. We'll, we'll talk about the welfare in a second. Um, but yes, we, we think defining it as a problem for cats and humans is, uh, is the right way to go. Um, second of all, <laughs> Uh, there's been a great uh, upheaval uh, with the terminology of, um, of uh, free roaming cats. Some wanted us to stick with uh, the term stray cats or street cats in, in Hebrew, Chatulei Rechov is used most commonly. Um, NGOs were, were very adamant. We use the term community cat, which conveys a sense of, of uh, communal responsibility towards the cats. Um, we chose free roaming cats um, for a few reasons. First of all, it's the most widely used uh, term in, uh, in, research, in research literature, uh, and we believe it to be the most neutral, actually, of all, of all terms. And most importantly, it's an all-encompassing term. The thing about free-roaming cats is that they're not a homogeneous population. They're, they're all domesticated cats, but some are feral. Uh, they don't rely on humans. They're not sociable. You can't uh, adopt them. Others are very friendly. They rely strictly on humans for food. Some may even be house cats that are let out to roam freely and cannot be distinguished from uh, unowned cats if they don't have um, you know, a collar. Uh, so we decided to go with free roaming cats. When answering the question and defining the problem, we saw that there are two opposing views. Uh, those who see free roaming cats as an asset to the community and those who view them as a nuisance. And the, the use of the terminology corresponded with the people's views on free roaming cats. So those who viewed them as a nuisance because of um, uh, sanitation problems due to feeding or uh, spraying cats invading their property, uh, uh, fighting, et cetera. They usually regarded them as street cats or other uh, names to do with garbage, like um, garbage cats in, in Hebrew, and those who thought that cats are beneficial to the community and that the main problem was the cat's poor welfare, they regarded them as community cats or homeless cats. But we did see that most stakeholders eventually agreed on the key, the key issues of the problem. 
um, while they emphasize uh, different aspects of the problem. So NGOs and cat caretakers spoke mostly about the poor welfare, the high mortality on the street, but Renarians spoke a lot about uh, public health issues like rabies. Um, ecologists, zoologists spoke about uh, the impact that cats have on wildlife and the ecosystem and local government mainly emphasized um, uh, public nuisances, which is, makes sense because they, they, they receive most of the complaints. Um, what did we learn from talking with, with uh, experts <coughs> in the field, as well as conducting our own survey? So we know that the welfare of cats is impaired on the street, but to, to what extent? We now know that between 75% and 90% of, of kittens don't survive over one year. Uh, adult, ca adult cats live um, on average less than five years compared to a house cat that lives uh, between 10 to 15 years on average. Around uh, a third of free roaming cats uh, die from traffic accidents, from dog attacks, from diseases, some are euthanized. Uh, we've learned uh, communal feeding is not only a very common phenomenon, it's almost unprecedented. Uh, we know in a country of 9 million, between 20 to 30 percent uh, feed free roaming cats irregularly, but still we're talking about millions. Um, uh, and a few hundred thousands of them are what we call heavy feeders, feeding them uh, on a daily basis. On a daily basis. So once again, this isn't just a widespread phenomenon. It's, the scope is, is amazing. Um, there are quite a few reasons for this. They're mostly self-reported. I won't get into that because I don't have the time, but in any case, it's a very interesting uh, research subject, I think, from a sociological point of view. Um, and in case you're wondering, the profile of most cat feeders is of a middle-aged female, but one that is usually married might surprise some of you. Um, another thing, uh, we know that cats are natural predators, which is usually thought of as a benefic is beneficial because they hunt species that we consider pests, such as uh, uh, mice, rodents. Uh, however, they don't distinguish between pest species and other wildlife species, and they also hunt when they're not hungry. So as it stands now, um, they're considered responsible for about 14% of the global extinctions of mammals, uh, birds, and reptiles and they can cause real damage, especially if they live in natural areas or next to uh, nature reserves. Um, finally, trap, neuter, return, what we call TNR, basically catching the cat in their territory, bringing them to a clinic, having uh, them uh, sterilized, neutered um, uh, surgically, and then returning them to their territory. It's a very, it's a very uh, common, common practice. It's considered by many to be the optimal. Yeah, and I think so I'm, I'm starting to interrupt, we have two minutes. But... Two minutes, okay. Um, okay, these, these are the last, uh, the last few slides, uh, the most uh, interesting ones, but I do have to stop, wait, to just talk about TNR. Um, it is considered um, the optimal solution for controlling population, but it's not a simple one-off solution. Uh, as many believe it to be, you have to maintain a very high rate of neutered cats between 70 to 90% for many years, which means hundreds of millions of shekels. And there are also compensation mechanisms such as immigrant immigration of unneutered cats into the population. So it's not a, a miracle tool, unfortunately. It does have an individual an individual uh, impact on, on, uh, on the cat that is neutered. Uh, they live longer, they suffer less diseases. Okay, uh, the last two uh, slides. Uh, when looking at the main themes that uh, emerged from the public engagement, we saw two main things. On the one hand, there is much consensus on certain things, agreement on the problem of overpopulation, um, nationwide consensus against culling as a method of controlling the population, generally favorable, favorable views of, uh, on feeding. Uh, even when it's considered a nuisance, they don't want to stop it altogether, but they do want to regulate it. Uh, and when asked what the best solutions are, we see again TNR, um, local cooperation between vets and cat caretakers and educating the public, even though the focus is on different aspects. Um, we do see uh, perception gaps, uh, quite a few of them. People wish to control the overpopulation and decrease the number of free roaming cats, but they support uh, unregulated feeding. So there's a strong disassociation between available food and overpopulation. We see a great concern over the cat's uh, welfare, but at the same time, an attempt to normalize their presence in the public sphere, uh, which harms their welfare. Uh, disbelief regarding uh, impact on wildlife. Many don't believe cats harm wildlife, um, even when confronted with, uh, with facts. And uh, basically, in general, you can say there's a lot of tension between science and, and emotion with some people thinking we, we're falsifying evidence and facts to justify harming cats in, in some way. 
Um, so that's basically it. Uh, we've seen a, a lot of emotions, differing views and distrust when it comes to, to the matter of free-roaming cats. Our hope is that um, by the end of the public engagement process, especially after, after having key stakeholders sit and talk to each other for the first time at the round tables, we'll have overcome some of these, uh, of these obstacles because the reality is without collaboration between interested parties, none of these problems will ever be mitigated. And hopefully we'll manage to make some progress for the benefit of, uh, of cats and humans alike. So uh, stay tuned. Thank you very much, uh, Liran. And my apologies, I had poor connection and sorry for interrupting. You. No. Uh, so this is this day deals with challenges and you took on quite a challenge and I'm curious to hear uh, the final outcome. Um, so thank you all for this uh, insightful presentation. And it's been really fascinating um, to, to hear how these topics intertwine and also to share her thoughts and comments on that. Uh, we're very happy to have here with us uh, Dr. Julia Urbanis, who is an independent scholar and consultant. Uh, she's also the founder of the Animal Geography, uh, Geography Specialty Group at the American Association of Geography. And she will comment on the presentations we've just heard. Then we'll have some short time for questions. Okay, great. So um, everybody can hear me. Yes, I, I do. I am unmuted. All right. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you. So before I begin my comments, I just wanted to extend my thanks to Amnon and all the organizers of the conference. It's really an honor to be invited and participate. And I'm just really excited to learn and see, see who I'm gonna meet over these next couple of days. And I also wanted to extend my thanks to Anu, Maria and Miriam and Liren for sharing the fascinating work that they are doing. And so the title of our session was Challenges in Time and Space. And it goes without saying that we continue to face an overwhelming number of challenges as individuals, countries, and, the, and as a planetary whole. And I wanted to acknowledge my privilege because I have received the COVID-19 vaccination and so many others around the world right now are continuing to struggle during the pandemic. And my heart goes out to anyone who has struggled with the virus themselves or has possibly lost friends or family members to COVID. And I also wanted to acknowledge that we're holding this conference in the midst of a variety of national and international political and military conflicts that are exacerbating the socioeconomic distress that we're living in um, during this pandemic. And so for me, this conference is really a welcome opportunity to kind of temporarily set aside all those stressors and enter into a community of humans that are working towards a positive future for all species. And as a discussant, I was tasked with bringing together the three papers that we've just heard, which ranged from the free roaming cats in Israel to street dogs in Afghanistan, Iraq, and uh, India, and kind of the dog poop, dog poop politics of these 140,000 tree wells in Brooklyn, New York. So it's quite a wide ranging geography, but I've pulled together three themes that I hope will provide kind of food for thought as to how we can continue to move from challenges to opportunities. But I'd like to begin with a bit of context about my own perspective as an animal geographer. I think it's safe to say that I grew up like almost all of us, that is surrounded by animals in one form or another. We had pets, we ate all types of animals, we had animal toys, watched animal TV shows, went to zoos, farms, etc. And I would say that I've kind of always considered myself an animal person. But where my upbringing might differ from others was that we moved a lot because of my father's job as an engineer. And so I learned early on that people and animals were different in different places in a firsthand way. And so I believe that it was all this travel and moving while growing up that contributed to my becoming a geographer, even though I didn't even know it was something that you could do professionally until I began my master's in gender studies at the University of Arizona, where there happens to be a very vibrant and huge geography department. But once I found geography, I never looked back. I believe that geography's interest in connections and synthesis just resonated with my experience and my endless wondering about why is this thing like this here and not over there. And so it was while pursuing my doctorate at Clark University in Massachusetts that I was able to really immerse myself in what a geographic perspective can bring to the study of non-humans. And so geography as a discipline explores the environmental and human processes that shape our planet. 
The subfield of animal geography is normally defined as the study of where, when, why, and how non-human animals as subjects in their own right intersect with human societies. And this research covers the gamut of human animal interactions through place and scale based analyses of political, social, cultural and economic conditions. Animal geographers are often interested in the production of boundaries, for example, where and how are animals constructed as in or out of place or where or how have humans and animals been separated or conflated. Because these points of demarcation can help deepen our contextual understanding of human animal relations and provide opportunities for new ways of encountering, treating, and living with non humans. So, when I read and listened to the talks in this session, I was first of all just quite heartened by the fact that I now want to give all the authors, a literary scholar, self identified artivists, researchers, writers, and a public policy expert honorary titles as animal geographers because of their focus on place. And yet, together, I think their work highlights how many boundary related issues still exist, which pose a challenge to advancing human animal studies, or HAS, and the lives of animals themselves in our quote changing realities. So boundaries can be thought of as both the physical demarcation of spatial power in the world, such as the territorial limits of each country or political units within countries, but boundaries are also more elusive social constructions of how power is used to place certain people and or animals as inside and therefore part of a community or outside and not part of a community. We're all aware of the boundary disputes over the physical territories of the world. Yet I would argue that we need to pay more direct attention to the ways in which socially constructed boundaries impact human animal relations and thereby human human relations. And so the first theme, boundary related theme that I wanted to highlight has to do with boundary making between people about animals. And the paper that most exemplifies what I was talking, what I'm talking about here is a news work on street dogs in Afghanistan, Iraq, and India. While I myself have not read UK Marine Farthing's book, One Dog at a Time, nor US Marine Kopelman's From Baghdad with Love, Anu makes a strong case for how these soldiers' experiences are reinforcing problematic human to human boundary making using animals. In discussing how these soldiers felt compelled to rescue the dogs they met during their deployments, Anu reveals how this need to rescue goes hand in hand with deeply disparaging attitudes towards the local populations of Iraqis and Afghanis. These books then are part of an international boundary making using dogs that says somehow US and UK citizens are good and Iraqis and Afghanis are to quote Kopelman, old men in dresses and fat women in veils and therefore somehow bad. I think that she has definitely highlighted one of the key challenges to human animal studies in our changing realities in the sense that what are considered right ways of treating, in this case dogs, has depended almost entirely on a European centric model of animals as property and animals needing to be in the right place. Her descriptions of how people in Hyderabad are more likely to see street dogs as quote rightful cohabitants of the multi-species city with the right to live free from human control point to other ways of being in relation to non-humans that really needs to be brought more to the fore of Haas discussions. And for me, it's quite troubling because this type of boundary making between sort of the good West and the bad others is echoed in the language that we are seeing now around COVID. Whether it turns out to be from a natural, natural virus species barrier jump or a possible escape of laboratory research, the fact is that China and Chinese treatment of animals has come under tremendous scrutiny since the pandemic began. And in the US, negative attacks against Asian Americans and the Chinese people for eating wildlife and or using these large scale wet markets creates a hierarchical set of cultures and obfuscates the treatment of animals in the US in the industrial food industry and in research laboratories. So boundary making between human groups over treatment of animals, in my view, does not help promote a humane world for any group of people or animals. 
But yet it is so crucial that we as Haas scholars continue this type of research in order to more deeply understand the microprocesses and ling linguistic devices that help reveal the power dynamics at play. So the theme of boundary making between people and animals is my second key takeaway from this set of papers. And by this, I mean specifically, when are animals in the right place or do they deserve to have a place and who gets to decide? I found Maria and Miriam's paper on tree wells and Liren's work on cats in Israel, especially astute place-based analyses of the complexities of creating multi-species communities. For me, what ties the two papers together is their focus on the microgeographies of daily living and their attempts to make visible what are so often invisible. For those of us who do live in urban areas, we're all familiar with those lonely single trees we probably pass by without thinking twice. But seeing that full typology of tree wells and how these range from being seen as garbage cans to a site of struggles over kind of wild dogs who poop and pee everywhere versus somehow civilized dogs who leave all their dog behaviors behind to become some sort of, and this is my word, human dogs, highlights the difficulties of building a multi-species sense of community or in a news words, rightful cohabitants. The complexity of human responses to free roaming cats in Israel, as outlined by Liren, helps reveal how many stakeholders are pushing governments to act in quite contradictory ways to bring animals like free roaming cats into the larger community or to expel them. To see so straightforwardly spelled out how some groups see free roaming cats, almost akin to the street dogs in India, as beings with perhaps tough lives, but also free and independent ones, versus those who see them as purely a nuisance or an ecological disaster in need of control or extermination, really makes me mostly glad that I'm not a policymaker like Liren is because it's kind of a mess. But all kidding aside, Liren's work really exemplifies the challenges to building these multi-species communities. And I would argue that even just mapping these different boundary positions and sharing the synthesis of positions with all the stakeholders can hopefully help create new spaces for thinking outside the boundary. And the last point I'd like to make about the theme of boundary making between humans and animals is about the notion of a multi-species sense of place. The question of how to access a non-human animal's experience of the world is obviously, as we saw in the previous session, a huge ongoing area of research within Haas. For humans, a sense of place has to do with how we feel in a specific location and what meaning the location has for us, whether positive or negative. And we know from work in geography that a positive sense of place is essential to our well being as humans. If humans are displaced through environmental events or due to war or poor economic conditions, humans can struggle with a lost sense of self and their meaning in the world. But how are we to understand if any of that is relevant to other species? I think all three papers have touched on the necessity of trying to do so. For example, a news realization that the street dogs themselves do have their own sense of place, their own territories, and their own ways of relating to each other helps shape her evolving thinking on what it means to help street dogs. And Liren pointed out that free roaming cats seem to have similar notions of territories and cultures. So how can policymakers take a cat's sense of place into account alongside humans? And Maria and Miriam pointed out that in trying to control dogs pooping and marking in tree wells, humans are denying them their own sense of place and meaning making and reinforcing a boundary hierarchy that dogs need to behave like a human. And finally, Anu pointed out how rescuing the dogs from Afghanistan and Iraq remove the entire structure of the dog's sense of place. Even if the soldiers did it from their own place of caring, the fact is they put their human perspectives over and above the dogs. So the last boundary related theme I wanted to make in relation to these three papers is more about boundary crossings. When it comes to learning about all the depressing and traumatic things happening to animals, I can still, even after all these years of my learning, become completely overwhelmed with the pain and suffering. So I'm always appreciative when somebody can surprise me in a new way, um, give me a new way of seeing or a new way to make connections, because it helps gives, gives me, selfishly, a renewed sense of energy and hope. 
And in a news work, I found that she wove together her personal narrative about feeding street dogs and the pain of having killed one with the stories of the two soldiers and the perspectives of residents of Hyderabad in a manner that created several layers of empathy for any reader to connect to. And this kind of scholarly writing is a way to remove barriers between people because she effectively located herself right in the middle of the contradictions that we all live around the human animal relations that we each practice. And Maria and Miriam have really made it impossible for me to look at tree wells in the same way again. And they've actually made me look at them really for the first time. But now I can see them as these complex micro geographies of human to human relations, human animal relations and human ecosystem relations. And they've done so in a uniquely visual way that clearly reveals a critical typology, but that critical aspect invites curiosity and conversation and connection. And it is this invitational aspect that I find such a powerful option for half scholars putting their work into the non-academic community. And finally, Lirin's just extensive stakeholder work on free roaming cats reveals a government boundary crossing that I would say is also invitational because of its depth and transparency. Given the myriad of complex issues in Israel right now, that the government has chosen to put resources into developing a consensus-based plan for incorporating free roaming cats into real policy practice creates real hope for a multi-species community to emerge. So in closing, I hope I've brought these three papers together in a way that both honors their individuality and reveals their commonalities and contributions to a geographic way of approaching Haas scholarship by exploring where, how, and why boundaries between people about animals and between people and animals can help lead us to new insights and overcome some of the challenges we face as a community moving forward. So I just wanted to say thanks to, to everybody, um, all the panelists today. It was wonderful to meet everybody in person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, it, was really, it was really fantastic to, to hear how you put uh, all these uh, presentations together. And uh, I think um, really made some um, really insightful uh, comments on, on, on them. Um, so um, for me, actually, I also thought of it, um, it, it reminded me the, the first thing I thought of was the slogan of nothing about us without us in terms of giving animals voice in this process and how to do so. Um, so we have just uh, really few minutes and I'm sorry that um, this is all the time that we have because I really think that we could continue talking about it for quite a long time. Uh, but if anybody has any questions or comments they'd like to make on the presentations or the uh, discussion, uh, please uh, use the raise hand. Um, okay, so while people are maybe warming up for that, um, I was also uh, one, I also wanted to offer maybe one of the panelists if you want to maybe respond to what you heard or um, uh, elaborate on, on that, that, that will also be really nice. Um, I'm happy to go if nobody else wants to. I, one of the things I was thinking sure. about during Liren's presentation was, you know, I mean, in the, just the giant map of stakeholders that she worked with, I was just curious if there was actually any participant observations of cat colonies themselves um, and, and, and how exactly you were trying to ultimately bring the voices of cats in. That's a great question. Um, well, obviously I think you know by now, we, we're also an interested party here in the animal welfare department. I see myself as, as responsible to, to bring the voice of the cat. So obviously I can't do that, uh, you know, to the full extent, I'm not a cat, I am a human. I have, you know, my own, my own views on the matter. Um, but yes, I do, I, we do try, not only me, of course, the, the whole department, we, we try to think about what is best for the cat's welfare and also I do have to consider other animals as well that may be, may be uh, impacted uh, in the process. So wildlife as well. Um, 
and I think cat caretakers and animal um, NGOs definitely see themselves as, as uh, representing the voices of the cats. So I think um, we're pretty much covered uh, when it comes to the cats as stakeholders. Thank you. Um, we had a question from the audience, so Cosetta. Yes, hello. Thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, it was really extremely interesting and also for the beautiful um, analysis done by Julie. Thank you very much. I just wanted to ask Anu if, she, if she's aware of the uh, uh, project on stray dogs in Morocco, which sounds uh, uh, say which investigates the condition of stray dogs in, the, in an area of northern Morocco um, and which has uh, some similarities but also striking differences with the conditions of dog in India. Um, it's a project uh, run by some Italian researchers. It was started a few years ago. I think it started in 2013 or I mean, in those years, and it's still going on. With the, they've been con, they, there's been a continuous investigation on the changes in the population of dogs in Morocco and how they relate to the to the population there. Um, just, no, I, uh, I am not. I can send you. Uh, I can send you the link if you're interested. That would be lovely. That would be a great, great help because I am actually working on um, a book project about liter about street dogs and literary texts, and I'm trying to look at a, a, a you know a cross section of texts from various cultures, from various countries, from various language systems, um, and. Yes, I would absolutely love to know this. And it's Thank you. Really interesting to analyze how the relationship yes. of the population to the animal actually changes from area to area, which is this geographical issue we just highlighted. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you. Um, I know that there are actually a couple more questions and I'm sorry that we're running out of time and we're not going to be able to, to hear all those questions now. Uh, but I do want to encourage people who haven't had the, the chance to ask them or to address them to the specific people they wanted to, uh, to get people's emails from the abstract book in the website of the conference. And then you can turn to people uh, directly and, and ask your questions. Uh, so again, sorry for that. Uh, we really have to close down uh, this, this uh, session. Um, so I thank you again, all the, the participants uh, for this stimulating panel. Uh, we will now take a 15 minute break. Uh, and so please join us back uh, at, uh, this is 8.15 in Israel time, but in, according to your time zone uh, for the next session dealing with violence, oppression and domination. Thank you very much. <laughs>